Hello, friends. I'm Dr. Dave Layton, and thank you for joining me in this Bible study. We're taking a look at uh, what I've called Foundations of Our Faith. This is the final lesson, Lesson 13. We're going to be talking about Judgment Day in this particular lesson. One of the uh, perhaps most dreaded times in a student's life is when they have to face a test, something that typically students just don't like to do. Uh, that, that's a day when they have to demonstrate to the teacher what they know or perhaps don't know. Uh, most of us don't like to take tests for some reason. Perhaps we doubt our, uh, ourselves whether we're truly prepared or not. Well, friends, one day all of us are going to face a final test, a test about how we've lived our lives. And this test is going to determine how we spend eternity. So it's extremely important. Among all the concepts that we find in Scripture, certainly the idea of a day of judgment is one that's very often thought about. Some want to know, uh, some have even professed to know the exact time of its occurrence. Friends, I want to tell you real quick, if somebody comes to you and tells you they know when the day of judgment is going to occur, that there's all kinds of signs that are pointing to a date specific, don't believe them because that's not true. We're going to look in a little bit about uh, why I make that kind of a statement. But some refuse to believe that there is a day of, of uh, judgment coming, or perhaps they ignore it. Some sort of a, um, a sense of denial. Uh, uh, others believe in it, but see it as a horrible day, a day of dread. Well, the truth is judgment does exist. There will come a day of judgment. No one knows when it will occur, not even Jesus. And it does not have to be a day that we dread. It does not have to be a horrible day. Now, there's no doubt from Scripture a day of judgment will occur. The Bible actually has quite a bit to say about the subject. It seems that God does not want us to be unaware of it. He wants us to know that one day that day of judgment is going to occur. So in this lesson, what we're going to do, we're going to look at uh, a little bit about what judgment is. We're going to talk about some thoughts on what will happen at judgment, and I will touch on when judgment's going to occur. Well, friends, part of my objective in this lesson is to provide comfort and encouragement to those who have obeyed the gospel. If you have not obeyed the gospel, then uh, we want to encourage you, I want to encourage you to do so immediately. And as I conclude this lesson, I'm going to talk about what you need to do in order to be prepared, not only in uh, this life and a life of service and dedication to God, but truly to be prepared for judgment. Well, uh, let's, let's begin by talking a little bit about what is judgment. You know, there's different definitions, different ideas that come to mind. One definition is uh, the process of forming an opinion or evaluation. Now, this might be a situation where uh, we, we look at different items and we determine which is best based on some sort of standard. It might be a personal standard, such as something we like or dislike. It might be based on specific qualities like uh, performance standards. Somebody did a really good job or whatever. So in other words, it's, it's simply how we feel about something. We make judgments all the time. Now, it can also be defined as a formal statement by someone in authority. A judge states whether a person is innocent or guilty of a crime and passes judgment, passes sentence upon uh, that person if they are guilty of a crime. But there's a set of standards that the judge is making that decision upon. Uh, you might think of a judge of a contest stating that a uh, person or thing is the best of all the other uh, exhibits or performance or whatever that are out there. Uh, this judge, uh, this, this formal statement of someone in authority, that this kind of judge is recognized as a source of authority and is qualified and authorized to make that kind of a judgment. <clears throat> well, in the context of our lesson, what we're talking about, of course, uh, is judgment before God. 
And it's something that each of us will face one day. Now, to the one who has obeyed the Lord, uh, has lived a faithful life to the best of their ability, this is not a day that uh, we should fear. It's a day to rejoice uh, to the one who has obeyed. Uh, it's a day that God is going to reward those who have remained faithful servants. Uh, the over overwhelming majority of faithful servants have gone through their life. A lot of times uh, their, their life, their faithful life is, is unknown to others, the, the detail, the, the scope of it. But see, not on Judgment Day. On Judgment Day, those that are known only to God, those actions that are performed in, in, on, uh, that, that God knows about, perhaps others don't know about, they're going to become known to all. On that day, the servants of God, the faithful servants are going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's found in Matthew 25, starting in about verse 23. Well, sadly, for those who have rejected God, uh, they've embraced the world, living by the world's standards, it will be a horrible day, the worst day in a person's life, worst day in a person's existence. This includes those who have turned away from God after first receiving salvation. God clearly gives us a choice, and we're going to either, because of the choice we make, we're going to either hear well done, good and faithful servant, or we're going to hear depart from me. Friends, I want to hear well done, and I want to hear it not just for me. I want to hear it for you as well. Well, with that in mind, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, what will happen at Judgment Day, because certainly this is something that means a lot to us. Judgment Day, again, uh, it, it's interesting. We, we think that on Judgment Day, our salvation is going to be determined. Uh, that, that's actually not quite true. Our salvation has already been determined when we obey the gospel. Friends, when we obey the gospel, when, when we repent of our sins and confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and are baptized by immersion in water, God has added us at that point to his kingdom. And we are in God's family, we are saved, and then we continue to live faithfully. It is possible if we turn away from that, that we can lose our salvation. God's the judge of that, but nevertheless, our judge, our uh, uh, salvation is determined when we obey the gospel. Judgment is when we give an account for our lives in service to God. Now, you can find that in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, even in Ecclesiastes 12 and 14, we live to serve and honor God. That's our duty, and that's what we do. So we are servants of the master. That's uh, Jesus describes it, and I've already mentioned a little bit about it, but Jesus describes this in what we call the parable of the talents, starting in Matthew 25 and verse 14. So uh, let me summarize the parable. Uh, it's a wonderful parable, and it's one that's very well known. Uh, this, this parable, Jesus teaches us that a man went on a journey, and he gives three of his servants an amount of money. It's, it's called talents. Now, we use the idea of talents as things that we're able to do. But in, in the period of time that Jesus was telling this parable, the talent was a form of money. So anyway, in, in this parable, uh, three servants given three amounts of money, and they're to use it for the master's benefit. Well, to one of the servants, he gives five talents, and that servant used it to make five more. Uh, the other servant had two talents, and that servant used it to make two more. It's interesting to note that they took the talents the master had entrusted to them and increased it. The amount is not so much what's important as the fact that they used it for the master's service and increased the, uh, the benefit for the master. But the third servant, the master gave one talent, and that servant didn't do anything with it. As the parable describes, uh, the man, when he's confronted about that, he, he buries it, he hides it, it doesn't do anything with it. Uh, so it didn't bring any additional value to the master. So when the master returns, each of the servants then present 
what he had done with what the master had entrusted him with. Now the servant that had been given five talents and the servant that had been given two talents, they were rewarded by the master, uh, the, the expression, well done, good and faithful servant. But the one who had been given only one talent, he was punished. He was, that talent, that amount was taken from him and he was cast out. Now his sin was in wasting the opportunity by doing nothing. That's the point Jesus is making here. It's not the amount. If the one servant or one talent servant had increased one talent, that's fine. That's what the master had entrusted him with. He had shown increase. He had produced fruit with his life, his actions, and he would have been rewarded. I, I like to ask people in, in a discussion, why do you think God created us? And the answer to that, quite honestly, is God created us to serve. He created us because he wanted a relationship with us. He invites us. We're part of God's family. But when God created us back in Genesis, you see where God created the garden, and he placed man in it. And in there, he tells man, uh, tells us that uh, a man is to, to keep the garden. So even from the very beginning, uh, we have served God. That was why he made us. So uh, that's his expectation for us. So when, when we uh, say that we serve the master, uh, that's exactly what we're doing. We're following the master's bidding. We're doing what the master wants us to do. You know, part of being uh, saved is that it's, it's based, uh, of course, on God's grace, but there is some action involved. We obey the master. And then as part of God's kingdom, we continue to serve. Well, back to that parable I just read, the, the parable tells us what judgment will be like. If we've not done as God expects of us, then we will be punished for not faithfully, for not faithfully serving the master. That's the bad side of it. The good side of it is if we've made the effort, we have tried faithfully to serve the master, we will be rewarded for that. And so if we're living faithfully, then we have nothing to fear as we stand before the master. That's a promise to us. Another thing about judgment is that our judge will be Jesus Christ. And those that have rejected Jesus Christ will be rejected by him. Those that have embraced Jesus Christ and, and, and again, lived by the teachings of Jesus then uh, they're, they're going to be judged favorably. Jesus stated in John chapter 5, starting in verse 22, he says, the Father judges no one, but has given all judgments to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. So Jesus is our judge. And I think rightfully so. Jesus died because of our sin. He purchased us with his blood, as Scripture teaches us, and we now belong to him. And the standard that we are to be judged is the teachings of Jesus. In John chapter 12, verse 48, uh, that, that's what we read about. And that's why we must learn, understand, and obey what Jesus teaches us as found in Scripture. I want to turn also to Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 36. And going on there through verse 40, we see some more information about, information about this. Uh, this. This gives us a really good insight into the standard that we're going to be judged by. So one day a young man comes to Jesus and he asks him, uh, what, what's the greatest commandment of all? Now, now, there was a little bit of testing that was going on there trying to trick Jesus into saying something, but Jesus understood that, and he answered it very clearly. And, and you and I can read this and know exactly what we're going to be judged by or judged for. So when, when, when this young man asked Jesus the question, Jesus answered him and said that we must love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And then he says, the second part of that is that we must love our neighbor as ourselves. So two parts to the answer there, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And you know, if we love God completely, heart, soul, and mind, we're going to seek with every breath we've got to do what the master asks us to do. 
And so if we obey the teachings of Jesus, we demonstrate our love for God and our love for our fellow man. Jesus said that in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And that's true. So if we love God, we're going to do what God wants us to do. We're going to love him with our heart, soul, and mind. We're going to love him with everything we can. It's going to be seen in the way we live. It's going to be seen in our actions and our attitudes of the idea of love. Uh, we can find in the Bible who will be judged. Well, certainly everybody's going to be judged, but it's interesting in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, uh, Peter talks about how angels that sinned against God and were cast out of heaven will be judged. The reason is they rebelled against God. Well, certainly anybody that rebels against God has rejected God. Now, God loves his creation and will welcome us back if we repent. But if we continue to reject God, we are turning away from God, not God turning away from us. But also, not just angels, all created beings, are the humanity, all of mankind from all of history, are those that have lived at the time of Jesus' return, those that are living when he comes back are going to be judged. That's found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. And at judgment, we're going to answer for all that we have done, all we've spoken, and thoughts in this life, whether they're for good or, or for bad. Turn with me, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 5, starting in verse 24. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24 and 25. <clears throat> Paul, speaking to Timothy here, says the sins of some people are conspicuous. In other words, we see them. We know that's not right. So the sins of some people are conspicuous. Going before them to judgment but the sins of others appear later. So all good works are, con are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. In other words, uh, some people, we know what their sin is, we see it. Others, secret sin, but whether it's for good or not for good, it's going to be revealed. Again, for the faithful, it's a day of rejoicing. Our sins are forgiven through Jesus. We don't have to worry about it. Our sins have been washed away from us by the blood of Christ. So we should rejoice at the day of judgment. That's a very important reason why we must do everything we can to live as God wants us to. Now, we know what judgment is and what will happen. It's a natural question as God wants us or, or to ask the question, what is it that God wants us to do? How does God want us to live? And so now I want to talk about, as, as we continue through this lesson, I want to take a look at what's, what, what will, um, uh, or excuse me, when will judgment happen? Well, first of all, that's not necessarily the right question. We don't need to ask when will judgment happen? There's nothing we can do about it. Judgment will happen. So instead of worrying about when it's going to happen and something that I have no control over, uh, we need to ask a better question. So the right question to ask is, how can I be ready for judgment? This means that we must be in Christ and living faithfully. In Matthew 24, we read some very important teachings by Jesus about the end of the age or judgment day. On this particular event in Matthew 24, uh, Jesus made a comment to his disciples about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And, and, and this greatly bo uh, bothered the disciples. And, and so later, uh, they asked him some very direct questions about what he had said. And Jesus answered with two responses. The first was directly focused on the destruction of the temple. You see, the temple in Jerusalem, it represented the Hebrew religion. This was their heart and soul. And, and when the temple was destroyed, God was showing the end of one age and the beginning of another. Now, to a Jew, the fact that that temple was the heart and soul of who they were, their identity as God's people, that was considered God's house. 
And, and so for it to be destroyed truly would symbolize the end of an age, the end of their world, if, if you can put it that way. Well, Jesus gives some details about what would be going on at that time, and so they needed to be ready, and that's the key. They needed to be ready. But remember, this particular part of the, of the question and Jesus' response was specifically about the destruction of the temple. Now, the question asked by the disciples, though, was a two-part question. The, the second part of the question was about signs of the returning of Jesus and the end of the age. So Jesus gives an answer to that question that was different from the other. Now, sometimes people take this question or these questions and they combine them into one. Two-part question, two-part response. And so the second part of the question was, again, about the signs of the returning of Jesus, the end of the age. So to this question, Jesus provides some additional symbolic language, and he gives the key to the answer in verse 36. He states, but concerning, see, but, in other words, in response to that part, but concerning the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. Jesus himself said, I don't even know. And he ends it by saying, but the Father only. You know, God created us, and every event in history that has ever occurred has been because God allowed it to happen or God wanted it to happen at a specific time. Well, Jesus gives one more important response in verse 44, and here he states what is really the most important point, and this is at the heart of this lesson. Jesus says in verse 44, therefore, in other words, I've said all this, therefore, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. He doesn't say the Son of Man might come. He says the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So our role is not to worry about when it's going to happen, our responsibility is to be ready. And Jesus goes on then uh, it, it, to tell a series of parables about the teachings about being prepared. Uh, these teachings cover all of Matthew chapter 24 and 25. These parables about being ready for judgment, since we don't know when it will occur, but we can be assured it will occur. And the ones who should fear judgment are those who do not heed what Jesus teaches in these chapters. They are not prepared. Well, friends, let me wrap up. Let me offer a conclusion here. It's normal that we should be concerned, perhaps even afraid at the concept of judgment. That's a normal thing. Am I truly prepared? Well, as we grow and mature as, as servants of the Lord, uh, we, we understand that we are saved if we have obeyed what the master says. We're not earning our salvation when we do that. Salvation is based on God's grace, but it does require active faith on our part. And when I say active, it means we've got to do something. We can't just sit there and say, sure, I believe in God. Well, of course you do. But see, God's word teaches us in several places that we should not fear judgment, but actually look forward to it if we are a follower of him. So the question each of us must answer for ourselves is, are we ready for judgment? And if not, then we need to do everything we can to be ready. And let's talk about what that means. First of all, God does want us to believe in Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. He is our Savior. And we confess our need for Him, and we commit to following His teachings. Committing to Jesus truly is known as repenting. We're turning away from our life and focus on ourselves and turning toward Jesus and obeying Jesus, uh, turning from self, and we turn to Jesus. And then we're baptized by immersion, showing in a symbolic way that we have died. Our old self has been put to death. It's buried. It's away from us. And then we're resurrected as a new creation, a new creature, a child of God, Jesus uses the expression that we must be born again. And that's what happens at, at, at our baptism. And, and that's just the beginning, though. 
and, and, and truly it is just a beginning. It's a beginning of a wonderful life. It's a beginning of our existence as children of God, our existence of eternity, being in the presence of God and, and being able to enjoy that benefit, that relationship with God that, that mankind destroyed because Satan uh, uh, tempted Adam and Eve and, and they sinned. And all through history now, we have sinned. So it's just the beginning. When we come up out of that water, uh, that, that baptism, uh, from there, we strive to live faithfully. We want to. We said we would. We're going to commit to Jesus and his teachings. And so we follow up with that. We, we, we strive to live faithfully to the teachings of Jesus as we've committed to do. Now, uh, I, I really pray that if you have not done so, that you'll make the decision to become a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. And if you don't, uh, then you've got a lot to fear at judgment. And if you have obeyed our Lord, then I pray that you'll continue to live faithfully. And one day, you're going to rejoice at the coming of the Lord. You're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Friends, here's something that happens, though, and it happens to every one of us. It happens to me. It happens to all of us. As we go through our life, we stumble and fall. Yes, we do. We still continue to sin. Sin is a part of our life. But if we're striving to live faithfully, then the blood of Christ continues to wash us clean. We don't have to live a life of worry. We turn our focus onto Jesus Christ, and he takes care of the sin in our life. That's a promise, and I'm not saying that. That's in God's Word. That's in the uh, book of 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 5, and you'll see that. If we repent of our sins, and this is written to people that are members of the Lord's family, people that have um, confessed Christ and have been baptized and are striving to live faithfully, we're in God's family. God's not going to throw us out. You know that. If you have a child in your family and the child does something you don't like, you don't throw that child out of the family. Uh, you continue to love that child perhaps even more and, and continue to teach and grow and maybe discipline. That's part of it, but you keep that child in the family. And so if we stumble and fall, but we're trying to live faithfully, God understands our weaknesses. He understands our, our need for him, and he follows through with that. That is a promise and God is faithful to his promises. And so this really uh, concludes my lesson on Judgment Day. It's also the last lesson in this series of Foundations of Our Faith. I hope you've gained some information that uh, not only forms a foundation of your faith, but you can build upon it as you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for the encouragement I received because I know that some of you are listening to this and are committing yourself to living for Jesus. Friends, in all things, we give God the glory. Thank you.